I wanted to talk about today two very personal questions. Uh, why do I deal in rare books and what type of rare books do I love to deal in? Uh, I think I've mentioned before that these videos are really under the guise of being instructional videos for beginning book collectors or beginning book dealers, uh, but actually they're a type of uh, personal uh, bibliotherapy uh, for which unfortunately there are not too many professionals. Uh, the reason I'm asking these two questions is um, it's a great mental exercise because as a rare book dealer there is all sorts of interesting material one can purchase uh, and it is easy to go astray from uh, the type of books you truly are passionate about. I mean you may chase books because you think they are coveted in the market or they're profitable and before you know it, your inventory is not exactly the type of inventory you want to have or want to work with. So it's really good to sometimes refocus. Uh, and this is also a good exercise for collectors because there are, of course, the general questions, uh, you know, why does one collect and what should one collect, which are very similar. Uh, of course, uh, booksellers are essentially collectors, except that we have things for a much shorter period of time. We have to uh, pencil in prices and then have them wretched from our hands for the economic necessities of running uh, a business. There are all sorts of things that one can purchase. For instance, some dealers uh, specialize in uh, PMM books, Printing and the Mind of Man. This was an exhibition in 1963 that really highlighted uh, books of great importance and influence uh, to Western civilization. Uh, PMM books in the trade can be very expensive because they are important books. Uh, somebody, another dealer might specialize, for instance, in, you know, fiction of the 20th century written by women because women have traditionally been underrepresented in collecting, uh, in collections and in uh, institutions. Uh, both of those are certainly worthy and very interesting pursuits. Um, they are not necessarily the type of books that I uh, buy and sell. Uh, so I asked myself, well, what are the categories uh, that I uh, truly love? And they more or less fall into four uh, types of books. Uh, and I've given them perhaps, uh, you know, peculiar names, but I will try and give an example of each type of category so you can better understand. Uh, the first one is forensic analysis. Uh, the second one is serendipitous discovery. Uh, the third one is time-space continuum, uh, and the fourth one is beauty, uh, and I hope that the last one does not sound too superficial. It is honest, and I guess uh, like the, uh, was it Pantene? The Pantene commercial from the early 1980s, don't hate me because I buy beautiful books. Uh, so let me look at an example of each of those type of books and why it speaks to me personally and why that is the type of book that I really love to purchase uh, and deal in. The first one I mentioned was forensic analysis. Now maybe I've watched uh, a few too many CSI episodes of forensic files. Uh, I don't uh, have a particular fancy for collecting uh, hair or blood specimens. Uh, so I'm left with uh, intriguing puzzles to solve uh, in books, which have a sort of parallel feel to uh, forensic analysis. Um, this is a commentary of Luther printed in London in 1635. In and of itself, uh, it is not a particularly exciting book, and not one I necessarily would have bought, except that this book has a unique feature which caught my eye and presented a puzzle to be solved, and that is on the verso of the first blank is a sheet of paper that is affixed with an old 18th century nail. Uh, now that little piece of paper is actually a three dollar note of continental American currency, the formative uh, American printed bills. Uh, 
Uh, it was uh, issued in 1776, this particular note, the year of our declaration, and the Continental Congress authorized the printing of these largely to pay for the Revolutionary War efforts. Uh, this uh, bill has some uh, particularly nice features besides the uh, famous date there. It's printed in Philadelphia uh, by Hall and Seller. Uh, that was a very famous printing house in Philadelphia, originally formed by none other than Benjamin Franklin, uh, who worked with the Scottish itinerant printer David Hall. He actually sold his business out to Hall in 1766. So. 10 years before this note was printed, uh, and Hall later took in David Seller as his partner, and they continued uh, printing, uh, especially with government contracts, the reason that they printed some of these continental notes. Um, one thing I love about uh, continental currency, this particular one, is it actually is an example of nature printing. Um, nature printing was a type of printing, I don't know if it was invented for this use or certainly used early on by Benjamin Franklin as an anti-counterfeiting device. Uh, printing with leaves, uh, or in this case with the structure I think of a maple tree, uh, with the idea that uh, no two leaves were alike, so they could prevent uh, counterfeiters from printing identical notes. Uh, and also I think they use leaves, uh, I would say probably because snowflakes uh, were difficult to print with. I can't show you uh, the verse or the backside of this particular note, but it's also very interesting. It has uh, a uh, Union Eagle battling a heron, and it has a Latin inscription of uh, exito in dubious est. The outcome is in doubt, and sure enough, in 1776, the outcome of the revolutionary uh, war was in doubt. So there is the puzzle to be solved. Why would somebody uh, put a $3 note at the beginning of this book? So we can start to investigate you know, the provenance and signatures through Google Books. And sure enough, the first one is John Brotherton, uh, his signature. He actually turns out to be a London bookseller, the noblest profession, of course. Uh, in uh, the 1720s. Uh, some point shortly thereafter, the book makes its way uh, to New York, and there is a presentation inscription between two women from 1769 here, Anna Marie uh, given to Jane Watts in 1769 in New York. Uh, then on the last page, however, we see that John Watts, I think her husband, uh, turned the last pages into a sort of ledger book. Uh, and he records some promissory notes on the book, one of which is a rather prominent promissory one to pay uh, uh, Thomas Cox $3. So I assume that is the $3 bill that he intended or indicated that he wanted to pay. Of course, I don't know why he would use continental currency at that point. It was uh, greatly devalued uh, because they had printed uh, so much of it. But that sort of solves the puzzle for me of why there is a $3 note at the beginning of this book. And that is my example of, you know, Sherlockian deduction there. Let's move on to uh, a modern book, uh, Serendipitous Discovery. Uh, and I say uh, Serendipitous Discovery because this was in my closet for quite some time, and I don't think I looked very carefully at it. So then I noticed some interesting things about it that made me very excited. Um, this book is uh, printed in 1925, The Remains of Tang Painting, by discovered by Sir Aurel Stein. Uh, Aurel Stein is a personal hero of mine. Of course, I have 10,000 personal heroes, but... Um, he is the Hungarian-born Orientalist and great uh, explorer. And during his day, he was a household name. His exploits were printed in innumerable papers, and people followed him closely. One of the things I like about Stein is during this period, I would say, uh, Europe had a very parochial appreciation of their uh, cultural heritage. They felt 
that it rested, uh, the foundations of it, the influence largely upon the pillars, I would say, of ancient Greece, uh, ancient Rome, and perhaps uh, some of the Bible lands. Uh, but uh, to uh, paraphrase John Donne, uh, no culture or no continent is an island. Uh, and they had a sort of indifference during the period to their real cultural or their important cultural influences coming from, uh, you know, from India, from Asia, from Akhenaten Persia, from Egypt. Uh, and uh, through the expeditions of Sir Orwell Stein, especially to Central Asia, he really expanded the European intellectual understanding of the influences of these greater cultures on the development of their own uh, civilization. Uh, so a very important explorer. Uh, one of the great ex, uh, uh, expeditions he made, I think, was in uh, 1907 to the famous Donghuang Caves in uh, northwestern China, where uh, he um, worked on, uh, I think it was discovered by a monk, one of the greatest repositories of ancient manuscripts ever discovered. And he purchased, I think, something on the order of 7,000 manuscripts uh, plus uh, numerous fragments, which he sent back to England and to India for a trifling sum. I think it was like 130 pounds. Among those manuscripts discovered uh, was the famous uh, Diamond Sutra, which you can see in the uh, British Library today, uh, printed in the 9th century uh, and is often described as the earliest printed, uh, the earliest dated printed book. Uh, so sorry, Gutenberg, uh, because that was obviously, uh, you know, six uh, hundreds or so years uh, before uh, Gutenberg's uh, invention. So why uh, do I say this is a serendipitous discovery? Because as I was looking through it to catalog it, I noticed on one of the pages, and I just did not see it before, is a presentation inscription by Stein himself, presented with kindest regards, uh, December 1929. So I was very excited uh, to have the great explorer's uh, inscription there. Uh, another very interesting thing I found out about the book is it has a book plate here of Paul Joseph Sachs. Uh, Paul Joseph Sachs was uh, a great American investor, early partner, obviously, of Goldman Sachs and a very famous early uh, museum curator. So it's a very nice inscription uh, from the great explorer to this important uh, American investment banker, especially, I think, in December 1929. That was probably six weeks only after the great uh, crash of the market. Uh, so uh, he probably was lifting his spirits uh, with a, a little bit of culture there. I think it was also written shortly before... Um, uh, Stein's last major expedition, I think in 1930 or so, uncovering uh, more great manuscripts. And few uh, people have, uh, you know, uncovered uh, the treasures, uh, you know, for the greater world of a lost civilization like him. Although here's looking to you, Howard Carter. Uh, but a wonderful, interesting book and a serendipitous discovery. And really, uh, this is the type of treasure that I love to find and to inventory. Moving on to uh, what the third category, which I call it, uh, I think I told time space continuum. See, maybe I've watched too many Star Trek episodes. And I don't want to go all new agey on my book audience here. Uh, but I would say that, uh, you know, uh, I'm not a religious person, I'm certainly a spiritual person, and I do have a sense of the interconnectedness of uh, time and space. Uh, and I'm especially interested in the subject, whether it's through the perspective of quantum physics, or I think the other day I heard a podcast that was quite intriguing on how uh, the human memory encodes time, uh, for instance, how you can remember you know, precisely uh, the date uh, of when you first saw The Goonies, uh, the movie. Uh, but uh, that really interests me. And when you hold a book, uh, you really get a sense, especially in autographs and manuscript material, an intimate connection 
uh, you're immediately brought into the time and the place of that item in a way that's you know near impossible when you're holding just a modern history book recounting uh, an event. So as an example of that, uh, I have here two uh, portfolios. These are uh, a whole archive of letters in their original envelopes uh, dating from about 1857 through the Civil War and shortly thereafter. And they were written to a Miss Eliza uh, Guthrill, and she was evidently a school teacher. It starts when she's age 17 and goes on into her 20s. Uh, she must have been a delightful, intelligent woman from all the letters, uh, but also obviously perhaps a beauty because most of these letters are suitors uh, and uh, you know asking for coming up with different marriage proposals. But what I love about this type of archive uh, is, and again, this is not the type of document that is a uh, important documents for the surrender of Appomattox or something. This is everyday perspective of American soldiers uh, during uh, the war, you know, locked away in their tents on battlefields, imagining this woman and writing her in difficult uh, circumstances. And you can really appreciate, uh, as I say, the time and the place uh, of being there. And I can just read a couple uh, short things from the letters. He's, here is one from 1862 in Virginia. He's says to her, how long is the war going to last, is the question so often asked. For my part, I cannot see that it is any nearer or closer than one year. You may think I am selfish, but not far from that. I am anxious to see the old union restored, as it were, for the country, the best government that ever the sun had shone upon. Uh, and then there's a letter, another random letter here from April the 21st, 1865. So this is uh, six days only after the assassination of Lincoln. So talk about immediacy of being there and hearing and feeling the words of the person writing this. Uh, and he says, uh, it is a great time of mourning all over the land. Abraham Lincoln, as you have doubtless heard, has been cut down by the hand of a cruel assassin when it seemed he was much needed by the people, when it seemed also that the light was breaking in upon us as a nation. So some beautiful words, and he goes on to discuss uh, Lincoln's uh, forgiving uh, spirit. So these type of collections and sometimes books really um, interest me because, again, you are transported immediately into the time and place, uh, and you really sense that uh, interconnectedness uh, of humanity. So uh, a lovely book there collection there. And finally, I said I would uh, get to beauty, uh, and I can only uh, do a little bit of a teaser on this book. I can't go into a full description because I'm actually cataloging it now, and it's going to uh, be on display at the upcoming New York Antiquarian Book Fair. I think it's September 9th, so if you're in Manhattan, uh, come and visit at the Armory. Uh, this is a 13th century uh, medieval Bible, uh, and it is written in an absolutely minuscule hand, uh, typical for uh, 13th century Bibles of the period, uh, on vellum. Uh, and what I love about it are some of the illuminations and the drolleries throughout the historiated initials. I mean, and it is such an honor uh, you know, to be able to purchase and sell uh, such a thing of beauty as an early uh, illuminated uh, manuscript like this. So again, just a little bit of a teaser uh, on it as I am cataloging it this week, but, you know, there is no escaping that booksellers are attracted uh, to beautiful treasures. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much for listening, and as I said, if you're in New York, visit me at the book fair. If you have any questions at any point, uh, feel free to reach out, and I would love to know uh, if you really think about what type of books uh, you buy and sell or collect. Uh, I'm always happy to hear from you, so thank you so much.